Kwame Bailey, the author, reading from my book, The Education of a Black Radical. This chapter concerns the National Student Association Convention at the University of Minnesota campus in the summer of 1960. As the convention progressed, I got the definite impression that not only was the general consensus of opinion pro-desegregation, but also that the National Student Association, at least politically and publicly, if not necessarily in practice in every delegate's hometown, would come out in favor of the sit-in movement and pass a resolution back in it. But sometimes, in late night dorm debates or arguments over dinner or beer in a lounge, this feeling was hard to remember. I tried to remind myself that regardless of who won any particular argument or what conclusions were drawn, when they got on the airplane or train that was taking them back to school, these white kids were going to be the same white kids they had been when they had arrived. It didn't matter. All we were doing in these late night debates was bruising each other and banging one another around. And we were doing it probably quite simply because for the first time in our lives, we could get away with it. It was a new experience and sometimes it felt good. Sure, there was a lot of anger and hostility and some yelling and screaming, but not a whole lot was accomplished. That is to say, nothing beyond the interaction which was accomplished and, in retrospect, perhaps the interaction was accomplishment enough. I remember a short, stocky, combative black delegate from Texas who would tirelessly argue with the crowd of whites until three or four in the morning, if they kept at him. He would say, quote, you white folks have a lot of nerve trying to characterize blacks as uncivilized. He said forcefully, but without malice. And then he'd say, but what right have you to appropriate for yourselves a premium on civilization? Remember, it was your so-called civilization that kidnapped our forebears and enslaved them by the most barbaric and violative of human decency and dignity. Do you dare to censor us for raising our voices in protest of your historic degradation of our people, he argued. The white students would sit absolutely motionless in the lounge, wrapped with attention. One night, a white delegate from Alabama responded, quote, but you folks can't take the law into your own hands. You're breaking the law down there. That's the point. Sure, I'm in favor of desegregation. I don't have anything against coloreds, but I think y'all ought to have your own schools and restaurants. If the laws are wrong, then the thing to do is to go to the legislature and get them changed. There are a lot of Southern schools in this association, and already a lot of them want to drop out over this thing. It's getting more and more difficult for those of us who support the National Student Association to keep our schools in. He took a deep breath. What it boils down to is that this association shouldn't be getting involved and taking sides without knowing all the facts. Facts? asked the black Texan. Okay, let's talk about the facts. Let's take these laws, the very laws you keep talking about, laws you violate with impunity to trample on the rights of our people. Let me explain this to you. Listen close. Any of your laws that set secondary and inferior terms for us have no legitimacy. He stated with careful emphasis. We will not obey them. But you are a citizen of the country. Yes, being a citizen by birth doesn't make you a member of the club, now does it? I don't understand. I didn't think you would. One night the topic turned to miscegenation and the fanatic segregationist fears that integration would destroy the purity of the races. After several rounds on that topic, the Texan had about had his fill. So he said, quote, Who, who's to say that miscegenation wouldn't do the white race a lot of good. No, seriously. White people go around comparing blacks to monkeys, don't you? He looked across the table at the four puzzled faces. Sure you do, but now I'm asking you to take a good look at yourselves and a good look at me and a good look at a monkey and compare similarities. Look at that hair all over your skin, those thin lips, 
you tell me who looks more like a chimpanzee. Why don't you stop putting black people down and take a good look in the mirror? They were shocked. They were insulted, but they laughed. But one way or the other, their assumptions were challenged, many of us for the first times in our lives. It was in these kinds of dialogues that the notion of white guilt arose. The idea that if I, as a black man, tell a white person the truth about how I feel, then I'm playing on their guilt and trying to make them feel bad. In 1960, though no one used those terms because the experience of interaction was so new, the same feelings were very much present. Later, the same conversations we had that summer in Minneapolis would be dismissed as, quote, unfair, unquote, because the blacks actually answered the questions that were asked. We would be accused of manipulating the white people's emotions by exploiting their guilty conscience. We would be accused of uh, such, with such statements as, quote, don't lay a guilt trip on me, unquote, and that would become a common white defense. It sounds less Im implicating than to say, quote, it's not my fault, unquote, or, quote, I can't do anything about it anyway, but it means the same thing. Of course, in the later 1960s and into the 1970s, as dialogue between blacks and whites became more common, some blacks did exploit the interaction by trying to make whites feel guilty or personally responsible for the black condition. Whether real or exaggerated, blacks frequently took advantage of whites and used them for selfish purposes rather than trying to convert the white person to their way of thinking or their view of the world which is really the only legitimate reason for that kind of dialogue. The goal is to change someone's mind, not to badger them into giving you something. So if nothing else, we established a degree of interaction that summer that broke new ground in race relations. A lot of it was unnecessary and painful for most of us. I'm sure that we went back to our colleges with minds unchanged, but at least we had been confronted with each other's prejudices face to face. This sort of sharing for its own sake by representatives of a broad cross section of America was an unheard of and wonderful thing. This is from the book, The Education of a Black Radical. I'm the author, Diami Bailey. Thank you. <laughs>